This talk, as Greg said, is about consuming REST APIs for all interpretations of REST. You've probably heard many talks about how to build REST APIs, but there's not too many people who have done talks about consuming REST APIs. And that's possibly because a lot of people probably think, that, well, there's nothing really to talk about. Hopefully, after this talk, you'll agree with me that there are some things that are worth talking about. So whether you are a full-blown Rastafarian, as I've been accused sometimes, or whether you think swagger is like pure awesome, I think you'll find that in this talk there'll be some food for thought. My name is Daryl Miller, and I am Canadian. Do we have any Canadians in the audience? Wow, we do. It's a long flight, isn't it? I am never going to complain about transatlantic flights anymore. And if you're interested, I didn't realize this is a cultural difference. The phrase, I am Canadian, actually has its own Wikipedia page. But actually, I was born in England. We have any Brits here? Yay, look at that. So, being a Canadian Brit, really it just means I say sorry a lot, but I really don't mean it. <laughs> so I'm going to apologize for that right up front. This is my first time here in Australia, and I'm really excited about being here. It's been really cool walking down the streets, and as I tweeted the other day, it's kind of like a little bit of a mashup of being back in England and some North American influence and some Asian influence. It's really cool. I have a cousin who moved here recently from England, so I'm going to go get to see uh, that person. I'm going to go visit them on Sunday. I haven't seen them for 27 years. I wasn't going to go back to England to visit them. So Australia, England, Canada, what do these three countries have in common? They all use HTTP. Yeah, sorry, Lizzie. <laughs> this is where my true allegiance lies. Let me tell you a little story, a little trip down memory lane. Going back about 10 years, I was doing an upgrade to .NET framework on a server, and I had some Azimex SOAP services running on it, and they were consumed by a VB6 client running on XP Embedded and Compact Framework running on Windows CE devices. And the upgrade to the server broke my client devices because I had to do an upgrade to Web Services SOAP Toolkit. I don't know if any of you ever remember that delightful little library. And I was longing for WCF to come along and solve all my distributed computing problems. Yeah, well, you can imagine how that turned out, right? And I was looking at it, I was like, okay, SOAP stuff and the web, it's all based on HTTP. Like, and the web's doing pretty well. It, it doesn't change every three weeks. Like, HTTP hadn't changed in many, many years at that point. So I decided to invest some time into really learning about HTTP, how it works, why it works, why it scales, why it doesn't need to be changed as often as all the libraries that we're constantly having to update. And it's paid off tremendously for me. I mean, 10 years further down the road, HTTP is still not really changed. OK, they brought out some new specifications, the RFC 72, 30, 30, 31, 32. But really, those were just clarifications of the original HTTP spec. They don't actually change the semantics of HTTP at all. And even with HTTP 2, it's new, it's coming out, it's coming out really quickly, but it doesn't change the application model. It doesn't tell you how to build applications in any different way. In fact, there are performance improvements that allow you to use HTTP even more the way it was originally intended. So for the next 35, 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about how to consume HTTP APIs, what I think we're doing wrong, and how I think we can do it better. Now, in the spirit of my love for HTTP, none of my talks would be complete without some obscure reference to an HTTP status code. So the content I will be presenting can be considered coming with a 203 status code. Now, if you're not familiar with 203, because you probably don't ever see it on the web very often, it means non-authoritative. It means the content has been transformed, processed, interpreted by some intermediary. In that, this case, the intermediary is me. You've been warned. 
And as this talk is called Consuming REST APIs, and because I always tend to gravitate towards food analogies with APIs, I decided to make this a theme. So here's today's menu. I'm going to start talking about the current state of affairs, the API economy, and how we currently consume APIs using client SDKs. For our main course, we're going to talk a little bit, I mentioned, for interpretations of REST. What do I mean? People have different understandings of what they believe REST is. And we'll talk about what is important there. Talk about change and why it's actually good and we can't avoid it. Talk about reuse on the web. And I will reveal to you the secret of REST clients. And just to top off with desserts, I have some samples and libraries and other talks that you might be interested to discover more information about the topic. So the API economy. This is where the API itself is a product. We're, we're selling APIs to companies who want to integrate functionality from all different APIs into their product to deliver another product. I mean, Stripe is the canonical example of a company who their sole product is an API. If you want to do credit card processing, you just plug in a Stripe API, and all of a sudden, you can do credit card processing. The products can now be built by combining services, just like our soup here, right? We put ingredients together to make a meal. And it's becoming a massive industry. Programmable Web lists 13,000 public APIs that are available. And I'm sure there are many more that aren't listed on Programmable Web. Salesforce generates 50% of its $3 billion revenue on its, from its API usage. And this notion of integrating functionality with distributed APIs is becoming so successful that we're actually bringing it into our organizations. I'm sure you've all heard the term microservices, right? This idea is about using the same integration technique that we use for APIs, but within our own products, within our own walls, to be able to integrate various pieces of functionality. So in this API economy, how do we consume APIs? Well, most developers, they'll go to the API provider's website, and they'll go and download a client SDK and have some binaries and take a dependency on those binaries. But just like when you go into a restaurant and you order a salad, you're making a healthy choice, right up until the point that you cover it with salad dressing and croutons and cheese. It's not very healthy anymore. And the problem is you don't want to hide the goodness of the HTTP API. And Unfortunately, SDKs are considered essential by API providers for developer adoption. People tend to get scared of talking directly to HTTP, and they feel that they need this SDK in order to be able to communicate with the API. And unfortunately, some of the SDKs, depending on how they're built, can bring their own set of problems, because they can negate the benefits of the HTTP API, because they end up being an insulating layer between the client application you're trying to build and the HTTP API. They can kind of end up being a wrapper around that API, almost an RPC interface. Now, I use the term RPC carefully because most of the time when you hear conversation about RPC, it's usually a blaming game about talking about somebody's API service where it's, you've built an API, an RPC API, because you put a verb in your URL, right? But if you actually go back and read the original paper that talks about RPC, it really has nothing to do with the server side. It's about making it easier for the client developer to make that remote call by abstracting away all the details of that remote call behind a procedure call, which is what a lot of SDKs do. And the danger here is what we're doing is we're just moving the point of coupling. Instead of my application coupling up an HTTP API, I'm now coupling on a local client library that's compiled and has fairly tight coupling. And if somebody changes the SDK, potentially I can break that client. It's not a particularly flexible solution. And I believe it's possible to build tools to help people consume HTTP APIs without necessarily hiding that HTTP. The other challenge with building SDKs is it's really hard for API providers to do it well. 
Because first of all, they've got to build a whole bunch of them because they have to build them for all the platforms that all of their customers use. And you can take a couple of options. You can say, okay, well, these are the primary platforms, so we're just going to support, I don't know, .NET and Java if we're talking to the enterprise, and then the other ones, other platforms will become second-class citizens. Or it could be the opposite way around. You'll make Ruby and Python as your first class, and poor .NET guys and Java guys get the stuff six months later. The other option that people are starting to migrate towards is using code generation tools, but we need something to feed into the code generation tools, so now we have API description languages that we feed into the code generation tools to output the client SDKs so that we can manage the cost of updating these client SDKs. The problem is it's really hard to develop, generate good code from code generators, especially across multiple platforms. And you usually end up with some kind of lowest common denominator type of solution. So how do we, how can we afford to build good quality libraries and still support many platforms? Now I'm kind of dumping on SDKs and this notion of, of libraries that have tight coupling. and. There are scenarios where it's fine. You know, you make a salad dressing. If you put the ingredients into your own salad dressing and you control how much you put on, maybe it's not a problem, right? Because you have to have control. And in the SDK world, it means if you control both ends of the wires, if you can synchronize the deployment of your client application and your server, then you're good to go. There's no problem because that tight coupling isn't a liability. But so if, if it's the same team developing, both the client and the server, maybe you're good to go. But then, you know, you've got problems well, building a mobile app, right? So it's got to go through the app store. So now there's a delay between, well, when can we push the server API update and when are clients actually going to get the mobile device through the app store? And, well, maybe they'll choose not to update it. So there are challenges there. I mean, there's some scenarios where it does really work to JavaScript clients, right? JavaScript clients, you can push a new API out, you push a website out, they download the JavaScript automatically, and everything is awesome, it's in sync, it's fabulous. Until somebody goes, hey, cool, you've got a JavaScript, you've got an API there. Can we use that API also for this third party? Uh, and, or we also want to use that same API for our mobile because we want to reuse, right? Reuse is good. But now we have the problem is now next time I'm going to go and do an update, and I can I try and do this update where syncing my JavaScript client and my API, I'm going to break the third party. So now I've got problems that I can't update my JavaScript client because I have third party dependencies. So my chef's suggestions for this particular section is don't assume that the SDK that is provided by the API provider is your best option. It might be but it also might not be. You need to understand your deployment constraints and whether you can live with the coupling that that SDK might introduce. So I mentioned that you know, there are many interpretations of REST, and while consuming APIs, you're going to run into server-side APIs that people have built that have different perspectives on it. And it's useful to understand why this is and what is important and not important. So I developed my chocolate chip cookie analogy. Here we have three chocolate chip cookies. They are all chocolate chip cookies, but they have different recipes to make those chocolate chip cookies. So what defines a chocolate chip cookie? What are its constraints? Well, it needs to have chocolate chips in it, and it probably needs to come in a form factor of a cookie. Right? It's fairly simple, but there's a wide range of making it. The challenge is, as developers, when you say build a REST API, they want a recipe. They want prescriptive guidance. Well, how do I do REST? Give me specifics. So the web framework designer said, OK, we can help. We have these web frameworks you're going to be using. We'll build, we'll create a recipe for producing REST APIs. And they did that, and that's cool. Until the point where the developers started to think that the recipe from that web framework was REST. And all these rules became introduced that say, oh, well, this is how you do REST. Well, no, this is how that framework's recipe does REST. There are many other ways of doing REST also. Really, the important thing in all of this is the effect. With chocolate chip cookies, we want happy kids. This kid is happy. 
to his cookie. Okay, maybe the parents aren't so much happy, but the recipe is not as important as long as the constraints are respected and we achieve the effect that we're looking for. And rest is just is the same. You've probably seen lots of talks and they talk about the constraints of rest. It's got to be client server and stateless caching, uniform interface, layered code on my blah, 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 blah. That's not the important part. It's the effects. We're trying to achieve a system that is scalable, evolvable, fault tolerant, and composable. That's what REST is trying to achieve. Now, the thing is, sometimes people don't need evolvability in the application they're building because all of these effects and the constraints come at a cost. And maybe you don't need that particular constraint, so that particular effect. So people drop certain constraints, which is cool. It's about principle design, right? You choose what effects you want. Unfortunately, the name REST was carried through to these subsets of constraints. And that's where the confusion arises, because developers get upset when they don't get the effects. And you say, well, you're not getting the effects because you didn't follow all the constraints. But I'm doing REST. Remember. Kids love oatmeal cookies, too, and there's no chocolate chips in those. And if you're on a long car, car ride and you give your kids chocolate chip cookies in the back, you're going to get chocolate all over the place. You have to understand the costs and the benefits. One of the most common types of APIs that you're going to run into is a style of API that I call JSON REST. And I've coined this as the Putin of APIs. This is a Putin. It's a delicacy from my home province of Quebec. You take French fries, you put cheese curds on it, and then you layer hot gravy and the cheese melts into the French fries. It's just fabulous. And it's really quick and easy to make. And they're cheap. It's cool. However, okay. You'll recognize a JSON REST API because you have to go to the documentation, and the documentation tells you absolutely everything about the API. It tells you all the URLs that exist. It tells you for each URL what all the methods are. It tells you what status codes are returned. It tells you the shape of the JSON and all the properties that are going to come back from every single URL. The documentation is your contract. And we're used to this kind of being very precise about defining this contract because we're kind of used to local computing things, but distributed systems are a little bit different. And things change, and keeping that documentation up to date is hard. So now we're developing, we're again going back to the API description language, the swaggers and the rambles and the waddles and the I can't keep track of how API blueprint and all of these things which we're going to use. Now that becomes our primary place to define this API contract description and we are going to generate the documentation because we all love generated documentation, right? And the damage here is that is servers now can't change so easily without breaking clients because all of the coupling is implied based on this documentation contract. What we're doing is we're effectively giving up on the evolvability effect because we're not respecting buried inside uniform interface constraint. There's this other thing that's called self-descriptive constraint, which says in the messages that you send and receive, you need to identify all the semantics of the message. And we're not doing that in JSON REST because we're saying, well, we know in advance when we call this particular URL, we're going to get exactly this shape of JSON back. It's a pre-arranged agreement. And that's fine, right? If that's the design choice that you've made, that's not a problem. But you need to be aware that you have made that design choice. Now, you can help evolvability in uh, JSON REST by adding some hypermedia. This, believe it or not, is a patin. If you come to Montreal, you can go to a restaurant that's called La Banquise, and they have the fries, cheese curds, and gravy, and a whole bunch of other extra vegetables on top. And hypermedia can help evolution because it adds in this layer of decoupling uh, between the client and the actual resource URL. But there's still pre-arrangement on what responses are going to come back from a particular resource. So there's still some out-of-band coupling there. Another interesting way that 
uh, API providers are helping to convey conventions is through this use of media types, which is good because that's a, in the content type header in the HTTP message, we have the content type. So all of a sudden now this identifier is in our message, so we're moving towards self-descriptiveness. And here the GitHub API and Heroku API have media types, and these describe the conventions of this API, and it's good. It doesn't solve all of our issues because one of the things is we don't really get a lot of reuse about this. I really don't think Bitbucket are going to come along and go, hey, let's use the GitHub media type for the conventions, right? So it's a step in the right direction, but it's not necessarily the best way of going forward. Another approach that you'll see when you're working with APIs, and this is starting to happen more and more, if you, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Amazon API Gateway was released, and their interface to their API Gateway uses HAL, which is a generic media type. Uh, and, you know, like all good standards, we have lots of different generic media type uh, standards to choose from. We have Mason and Siren and JSON LD, and these help to convey conventions on how to embed links into representations, how to do forms, and how to do lists, and how to embed resources. They don't tell the whole picture, though, because there's no actual application semantics in these messages. We don't actually have any domain knowledge. You need to do a reference to either a schema or this notion called profiles and vocabularies and ontologies. Each of the different hypermedia types has different ways of layering application semantics on top of these generic hypermedia types. But again, it's a step in the right direction. So my recommendations here are just be aware of the choices that you're making, the effects that you want, and the constraints that you need to apply in order to achieve those effects. And understand the purpose of media types. Even if you choose to always use application slash JSON, that's fine. But know the price that you're paying for making that choice. There's another type of API that you will run into, data-oriented APIs that are kind of the buffets of the API world, right? They're also, you'll often hear them referred to as CRUD APIs, which the fact that CRUD and buffet kind of go together is a bit of a coincidence, but it's convenient. And the primary purpose of this API is to give you simple access to all the data owned by the API. And there's no assumption about why you might want to access this data or how you might combine that data. And it's fairly easy to do, but the API itself doesn't add a whole lot of value to the data itself. And you can have performance challenges due to the open-ended way that you can access the data. You can ask the Nougat team about that. If you think of like, data-oriented APIs at one end of the spectrum, the other end of the spectrum, you might consider scenario-based APIs. Certain foods are designated for special occasions, right? Like this birthday cake. And it's easier when building APIs to focus on a single scenario, a single problem, and then add new scenarios as you need based on customer feedback. And it's the best way to control performance of your API, because you know exactly why the consumer is trying to access your API, so you can optimize for it. And hypermedia works pretty well for this type of scenario-based API, because the hypermedia guides the consumer through this workflow. However, the problem is, is clients, in order to do this, clients have to be built a little bit differently, because they must follow a certain ritual in order to achieve a goal, like the ritual of the birthday cake. We bring up the cake, we light the candles, the kid blows it out, it makes a wish, we serve the cake. The same kind of situation with the clients, they can only follow the links that are presented to them by the server. And this is handy for evolvability because the server at a later point in time can potentially change what links are available and the client can react to those. The, the, again, the problem here is there's a fairly steep learning curve to learning how to build clients that work against these kind of APIs. And we have a bit of a catch-22 situation at the moment because in order to design a good hypermedia API workflow driven, you kind of need experience consuming one, and in order to get experience consuming one, you kind of need good hypermedia APIs out there. The situation's getting better, but it still there's not a lot of good practical guidance out there on how this can be done. 
So data-oriented APIs are great for quick, easy, you want to just expose data internally within your own company, or you know, if the taxpayer is paying for it, then OK, fine, use, the governments can expose data that way. But if you actually want to make a business with an API, consider strongly scenario-based uh, APIs. Which brings me to change. Restaurants change their menus to give variety to regular visitors because they want them to come back because they want to experience something different. Change is good. And APIs, change is good because it means somebody's actually using your API and they're asking you for additional features and additional capabilities in that API. It's a good thing. But the key is to start small and evolve quickly. That's how most good APIs should start. And based on customer feedback grow. So if you can boil water, then it becomes fairly easy to make some pasta, right? And before long, yes, we have a complete dish. But trying to build this complete solution up front is kind of the API equivalent of waterfall design. It's much safer to take the more iterative, agile approach where we build the minimum viable product first and then enhance it. And it guarantees that we give the customer what the customer needs and continue to provide good performance. But it requires accepting the fact that change is the norm. And unfortunately, we have this kind of false assumption that versioning is the primary way of dealing with change. I'm curious, am I before most people's time with Coke too? It was a complete and utter disaster, new Coke. But anyway. Versioning is painful. Right? Versioning is basically a way for the server developers to go, oh, yeah, we screwed up. We've got to make a breaking change. And we'll just put a version number in there. And we'll let the client developers deal with fixing their client applications to work with our new version of the API. And unless the client developer is going to stay on the old API for as long as possible, they have no choice. They've got to update their client code to deal with these breaking changes in the new version of the API. And my question is, why not? Maybe we can write the client to withstand some of these changes, and then versions become a little bit more irrelevant. A little extra effort in building clients can go a long way to making them resilient to change. And one is a bit of a philosophical, philosophical approach is you, you, you need to be kind of paranoid about the server-side API developers. Don't trust them, right? No matter what promises they make about their API, be defensive in how you build clients. Don't assume that because there's this set of properties here in this order, that order might change. Those some properties may disappear tomorrow, or there might be new ones that you weren't aware of before. You can build client parsing code that handles those scenarios fairly easily. Just because we're using one media type today doesn't mean that further down the road they're not going to change to another media type. I mean, we know that you know, curly braces are faster than angle bra brackets, right? So we use JSON now. And maybe in the future we'll decide that you know, significant white space is even faster than curly braces, so we'll move to YAML, right? Building infrastructure in place in your clients so that you can switch and support multiple media types is not that hard to do. Now, you may not upgrade automatically, but it will minimize the amount of changes that you need to make in your client code in order to support this new version or this new media type. Or somebody changes URLs. Don't scatter your URL strings throughout your client code base. Like Centralize them up into some dictionary somewhere or, or a set of string constants in a class file somewhere so that they're easy to change if they do change if you don't use hypermedia. And it's not that API developers themselves are evil people who are out to like, change stuff to break you on purpose. It's just they have their own internal forces that make them do things that they weren't expecting they were going to have to do. Or stuff changes out of their control. Change happens. You can't avoid it. But change is good. And if you take the attitude that I'm going to version as a last resort, then you're on a better path to building evolvable systems that don't break all the time. I'm not saying you don't ever have to version. I'm just trying to move people away from this mentality of we're building a V1 because we know it's going to fail and we're going to need to do a V2 at some later point in time. 
Code reuse, I think, is software's holy grail, right? We're always trying to achieve code reuse. It's the path to higher productivity. And the web has been incredibly successful at code reuse. I mean, basically, we all use one of three or four web browsers as our client tool, right? That's a lot of code that everybody's reusing. JavaScript libraries are brutally easy to reuse. It's fabulous. But the API world is struggling to achieve these same levels of reuse. And it's partly because we've kind of gone back to our local model of modeling APIs uh, as a unit of reuse. And code-based systems, they use inheritance and interfaces and libraries and shared types in order to do, create reuse. But it doesn't really work like that in a distributed system because API consumers and providers, they may be on completely different platforms with different languages and definitely not shared type systems. And we're still searching for solutions. Again, currently, the, the API description languages are, are being held as the solution for describing APIs that could be reusable. And there have been efforts to create search engines for people to register APIs for reuse. But really, there aren't that many distributed APIs that are reusable. But the only one that I've come across is the Metablog API. And I think one of the reasons is comes down to the fact that APIs themselves are not a very effective unit of reuse for the web. Let me try and give you a pictorial presentation of why I think that is. So on the right here, we have, uh, we have a couple of servers that have implemented the red API and the green API. And we have a client that's consuming both from those two different servers and from the different APIs. And we've, re we've reused the green API on two different servers, but it's kind of an all or nothing proposition. We have to implement the entire API because it follows from this principle of interfaces. Implement the entire interface because it's kind of like a contract, right? But what happens if I only want part of that functionality? Or what happens if a read-only version of that particular API for one server, and the other API is going to do the write and read. And you, you get the server that's got the two APIs. It can be the composition of APIs on a single server can be difficult because the APIs define some kind of URI uh, hierarchy in the URI space. Well, maybe those two APIs don't really fit well together. They use different conventions, or maybe they even overlap, right? So it's challenging. And then we get to the notion of mashups of, of, of two different APIs. In this case, the server can't really tell the client that it's doing a mashup. Basically, we're reliant on the client going, oh, yes, this is some information from the, the red API, and I'm going to feed it into the green API. Whereas if we look on the other side, and the way reuse actually works on the web, we have our servers with our resources, the little circles designate resources, and what we pass backwards and forwards in the client and the service server are messages defined by media types. We have a green media type and a red media type. And for, if they're hypermedia types, they can have links that point to other resources. And we can do nice things now, like the server can send a representation back that has a link in it to the red and the green. So integrations and mashups can be advertised by the server. The client is actually ignorant. It doesn't know that it's a mashup. It's just two links. It doesn't know where it's come from. In fact, like the servers, I drew with a little dotted boundary because really boundaries don't exist. Our unit of reuse is an individual resource. This boundary of an API really doesn't make any sense. But there's another trick to enabling reuse on the web, and that is by we need to Maximize, to maximize reuse, we need to minimize the amount of knowledge that is conveyed in these messages as it go down to the client. We have a bad habit of kitchen sinking everything into messages and telling the clients everything about it. We, we, it's better if we can keep the client on a need-to-know basis. There's a question I ask myself is, like, can I interact with something in a meaningful way without knowing the meaning of what it, that content? I'll give you an example from the electronics industry. These little pink blocks here are from uh, electronic components called little bits. And this kind of cool. This can do home automation stuff. You can plug them all together and build stuff. And this is, we have a light sensor and a temperature sensor. And you can set the sensitivity. And they can flip a switch, depending on the input, right? But 
The light sensor doesn't care whether the light's coming from a, a light bulb or coming from this daylight or whether it's coming from your house burning down the light, right? There is, there is, it doesn't care, and that's what makes it reusable in many different scenarios because as long as it's getting light from somewhere or heat from somewhere, it can perform its role. So achieving reuse is about focusing on the things that matter and avoiding the things that don't matter. When it comes to reuse in media types, I have my pots and pans analogy. Right, you could cook all your meals with one pan, right? But we don't. We have different pans for different purposes. We've got pots, and we can boil potatoes, or we can cook soup in a pot. And with a frying pan, I can cook bacon or pancakes. So they have purpose, but they are not single purpose. They each address a class of problem, and each tool is optimized for simplicity and reusability. Unfortunately, in, in, I feel in the world of media types at the moment, we're trying to really do this. We're trying to build the Star Trek food replicator where we have one super media type that can do everything and we only have to deal with one media type and it can produce any kind of food. And maybe we will get there one day, but in the meanwhile, let's remember, we can use simple pots and pans in order to get the job done. Now, this idea of using multiple media types, you can take it too far. There's this notion called the media type explosion, and it's what scared everybody away from creating their own media types, because what they're saying is don't do this. Don't build media types that have a single purpose, because when you build a media type, you've got to write a spec to explain the semantics of it. Right? If you've got a popcorn maker, you can't really use a popcorn maker for a whole lot else. Or an egg slicer, unless you're very creative, you can't use it for much else. Waffle maker is an interesting one because it's pretty hard to make a waffle without a waffle maker. So sometimes you might want really specific media types. And I'm just curious, does anybody in the audience know what uh, this device is over here, this pan over here? I did get one person once who knew it. That is an asparagus pot for cooking asparagus. You don't all have one of those? So a consequence of what I'm suggesting is when we build clients, we need to support receiving multiple different media types. Um, and that actually helps us also with for backward compatibility. If you think back to the GitHub uh, and Heroku media types that had the version number in there, now we move to a new V4, we can add support to the V4 media type without throwing away support for the V3. Our client can now support both. So that's handy. We can also do clever things like manipulate the workflow of, um, of an application because today we're bringing back one media type, but tomorrow we could bring back something else. But as long as the client understands that media type, we can change the behavior of our client without changing the client code. So a lot of people think of hypermedia really as just a way of linking documents together on the web. But it's actually a very useful tool for enabling client code reuse. You need to understand the contracts that you're using. You might be using out-of-band implicit contracts. That's fine as long as you know it. But the more you can use explicit contracts that are in message, the more flexibility that can bring to you. And this brings me to the secret of REST clients. You can build the most amazing server API that's hypermedia-driven, workflow-based, implements hypermedia as the engine of application state, and I can write a client that couples to everything on there so that whatever you change, it's going to break my client. Right? Client code is very important. But on the other hand, I can hit an API that's a JSON REST API, and I can do a lot of work on the client to minimize the coupling that I have on that JSON REST type of API. Client code is key for enabling evolution. Server code helps to enable it. So that means as if a server provider does come out with a V2 API, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to create a whole new version of the client.
And it doesn't mean you need to necessarily stop supporting V1. Having a client that supports multiple versions is really useful, especially when you get into a scenario, you get a multi-tenant scenario, and you have one customer who wants to upgrade to the latest version of the API because there's some new features in it, and another one's like, no, no, we can't upgrade at the moment. We're going through an auditing process at the moment, so don't change anything. And as a developer, having clients that can communicate to different versions of APIs is really handy, rather than having to have four different versions of the client, and every time you try and run something against something else, you've got to figure out, well, okay, well, which version of the client do I connect to which version of the server it can become a nightmare. Same goes even within your own development environment, you're running through production stage test, you may have different versions of your API at different stages in your workflow, and having a single client that can talk to multiple of those environments can be very handy. And this is why it's so important to build flexible clients. So let's talk about some of the techniques that you can use in order to build more flexible clients. Sushi restaurants often have this ability to order omakase style. You basically express your intent, yes, I'd like some sushi. And you give the chef the ability to choose the type of sushi that they're going to deliver to you. That giving the chef that flexibility opens up the possibility for them to deliver potentially higher quality ingredients for a better price. On the server side, if we can break the coupling of request and response, we can give the server the flexibility to change how they respond to a certain request. And this has a bunch of other benefits. When we break the request and the response handling, it makes it much easier to test. Because now I can write a test that says, OK, go create me this request that does this. And the output of that process is an HTTP request object in whatever is the native language you happen to be using. And you can test that. Did it create an appropriate request? Is the method correct? Is the URL correct? Is the request body or the header set correctly? And on the response side, you can manufacture an HTTP response and then feed that through your response handling. You don't even need to mock out your HTTP client library to try and fake a request because the two components are completely distinct. The other thing that it allows by separating out the response handling, it allows what I call centralized response handling. And centralized response handling is this notion of taking advantage of the HTTP uniform interface. Every resource out there is capable of returning any status code at some point in time. We try in these API description languages to say, oh, it can't return it will only return a 400 or a 404 or this or that. And my favorite question is, oh, it never returns a 500? Wow, how did you do that, right? You can create centralized response handling so you can have response handlers so you can handle any status code for any resource by feeding it through what I call my, an HTTP response machine. And you get additional benefits, because you can plug generic functionality in here, redirect handling, uh, server retry mechanisms. You can put in authentication challenge handling. There's all kinds of mechanisms, maybe even offline support. And you plug it into this response machine, and you can all of a sudden get that capability across your entire API. You don't have to handle every single URL independently and separately and distinctly. Now, Sometimes the response that you get back doesn't have enough self-descriptive information to tell you exactly how to process that particular response. So there is another piece of context that I use, and that's what's called the link relation type. And obviously, this helps if you're using hypermedia, but there's also ways of doing it within a JSON REST API. So now when I get a response back, I dispatch on status code, media type, and potentially profile, some other application semantic type thing, and link relation type. I followed what kind of link in order to get that response. 
If you think of your web browser, when it goes and it follows the style sheet link relation type, it could get back text slash CSS. It could also get back text slash XSLT. And it knows how to process those two media types based on the fact that it knows it's following a style sheet link. So this notion of link relation types is very useful when you combine it with media types. I have a, a little analogy. It's like you, you're being approached by a dog. What do you do? Well, OK, you didn't really give me enough information to make a decision. I could do, I could pet it, I could do all sorts of things. But if somebody said, oh, you're being approached by an angry dog, well, it's a little e clearer the evasive action that you might want to take. So link relation types and media types can be combined to convey a lot of information into this HP response handling machine to allow us to react dynamically to responses that are being returned. Which leads us to our last piece of infrastructure for building clients, and it comes down to client state management. There is this rather wordy phrase, the hypermedia as of engine of application state, which is horribly acronymed as HATEOS that nobody knows how to pronounce. Um, and a lot of people assume that it just means using links to point to different things. But the hypermedia constraint is actually talking more about how you manage the state of your application, both on the server side and, in this case, we're talking about on the client side. And it requires a fairly different way of building clients to take advantage of this kind of workflow. And one of the most useful tools is when you're building clients to create this notion of a client state object. And you can kind of consider it like a view model for your entire application. And it works like this, right? So you have kind of an application controller that sits and waits for input. And then it processes that input and says, OK, I need to make a request. So it goes and creates a request based on the semantics of the domain. And then it passes that off to the native HTTP request handling infrastructure, which goes and makes a request. And the response comes back, and we feed it into the HTTP response machine, which then takes the returned representation and applies that representation on top of the client state machine. It's called REST because it's representational state transfer. So we're transferring a representation, and we're applying it to our client state model, which may change the model. We raise events, which are captured by our view, which update the user interface, which maybe present other options where the user can click and navigate to other links, which will go back to our controller, where we create a request and the cycle repeats. Using this approach is really useful in that it allows the server to completely change the responses it returns to requests, and the client doesn't break. So my final chef's suggestions are breaking requests and response is a really useful technique for reducing coupling, and it brings a lot of flexibility into your application. Just like I said, it's important to understand the purpose of media types. Link relation types can really be your friend. And this notion of applying responses to transform a client state is another technique that can help you build dynamic clients. I have a number of related talks. The first talk uh, I did at Xamarin Evolve using hypermedia to avoid the App Store actually demos in uh, C Sharp how to do this hypermedia as an engine application state and applying this, the diagram that I just showed. And it's on YouTube. Crafting evolvable representations I did at NDC Oslo. And it talks about how to build representation to avoid having to version or to reduce the need to version. And I did another talk there called Succeeding in Failing that talks about the uniform interface and handling standardized ways of handling error response codes. And .NET Fringe, I did a talk about some of the tooling that I've built. But unfortunately, that, that video is not yet available. I have a set of libraries that uh, I built for doing this kind of client uh, tooling. And it is available for free. It's all open source. I had problems in managing the dependencies and the NuGet packages. And it was a pain in the butt to try and keep all this stuff up to date. So what I've done is I've kind of aggregated it together and built HappyKit, which is a set of tooling 
to help people build better client SDKs. It's still very much a work in progress, but I have a bunch of samples of how I've used this type of technique. I have a, an SDK for, for RunScope, and I have some samples for Git and uh, DevForce and Stormpath, and I did one for Troy's Have I Been Pawned also, which are examples. Again, very much under construction work in process, but if you are interested, uh, I'm open to contributions and feedback. So with that, bon appétit, and thank you for listening. I will be around all day. If you have any questions or comments, do you want to challenge some of the assertions that I've made, I am very much open to feedback. With that, thank you very much.